hope that you'll turn in our text to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. On this week, uh, uh, Doug Stone had hip replacement surgery. On, we are now calling him the bionic curmudgeon. On, he actually is back home today, and on, I just encourage you to call him up and make him keep getting up and going to the phone because exercise is good for him. He appreciates your prayers. By now you have turned to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. <coughs> We're going to begin reading with verse 10. Now, the most of, more observant of you will recognize that I uh, ostensibly covered verse 10 last week, and so we're going back one verse on it, just because that's where God led me this week, and I, I think it fits well with, with what uh, God spoke to my heart this week, and hopefully uh, will speak to yours as well. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 10, I am reading from the New International Version. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that, you may, that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, as we open this passage and seek to discover your word for us today, we ask that you would keep us from the distractions which would prevent us from hearing from you. In the name of Christ, amen. Of course, in our English texts, we are closing out a chapter in the Bible. But when Paul wrote this, it was a letter. And I don't know about you, but when I write letters, I know it's kind of a lost art, but when I write letters, I don't break up my letters by chapter and verse. On, I don't you know, put a little number, this is you know, thought number 13 <laughs> under subheading 1. On, that was actually added later in the text, and so Paul would have just flowed from one thought to the next as he was writing it. And he wrote like you and I write oftentimes, where there's no flow from one thought to the next. We, we just see that squirrel. Oh, look, there's something there. And, and he wrote of that. But in this passage, Paul is, is coming to a point of uh, almost summarization of what his concerns for the church at Thessalonica are. You remember he went there and he preached for three weeks, planted the church, got run out of town because of the mobs, and now he sent Timothy to Thessalonica to report how things are going. Timothy has come back, and as a result of what Timothy has said, he is now writing this letter to the church of Thessalonica. And when he gets to this point, he's, he said, remember he's talked about what you expected and, and the, the good word that he received from Timothy, and now he, he lays out his prayer for the church there, why it is that he has such a concern and what he wants for them. And he's going to pray for three life essentials, three spiritual life essentials. Um, we're not talking about uh, the ability to, to have good food. We're talking about the ability to live as God wants us to live. So three spiritual essentials for the believer in Jesus Christ. And he begins by saying that he wants to uh, make up anything that is lacking in their faith. So the first essential of a spiritual life is faith. You know, verse 10, we pray that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. It's an interesting concept that he's going to supply what's lacking in faith. When, when you get together with theological geeks, uh, read that as pastors, uh, and, they, and they start talking about theological issues. And, and one of the issues we, we sometimes talk about is, what is saving faith? What does it take to be a believer? And uh, 
cut to the very heart, it's, it's quite simple. We believe as a child, uh, you know, that we have some sense of personal responsibility and need, and we trust Jesus to meet that need. Uh, you know, if you have faith as a child, a child doesn't understand some of the deeper theological issues that, that might trip up adults. They, you know, a child doesn't have any concept of a hypostatic union. How many of you have a concept of a hypostatic union? There's at least one seminary graduate he ha- ought to be raising his hand. Okay, well, you know, it, it, but when, when theologians get together, they talk about these things and what is necessary for you to believe? You know, do you have to, in order to get to heaven, do you have to believe in a full-blown theology of, of the Trinity? Or do you have to have a pro- proper eschatology? Do you have to have an understanding of the difference between a symbolic view of communion, uh, the concept of transubstantiation and consubstantiation? I've used up all my big words for today, by the way. Um, you know, the, the question is, what do you have to believe? Well, the, on the one hand, you believe in Jesus. God loves me, and I know that he sent Jesus to die on the cross and, and save me from my sins, and he rose again. Very simple. It's something which even a very young child can understand. But there's also another level of faith which, which I believe Paul is hoping for and praying for for the church at Thessalonica. It's, it's a basic level of spiritual maturity. It is a level that says, at this point, when you have, have an understanding and a grasp of these theological concepts, you can say that you have at least beginning maturity. Without a concept of these uh, basic core beliefs, you can't say that you're spiritually mature. As a matter of fact, as you grow in your understanding, you could argue that you can't even call yourself Christian if you deny these things. But at some point, you ought to embrace core doctrines of the church. And I would suggest that there are seven core doctrines of the church. Now, this is not the doctrinal statement of the evangelical free church of which we are a part. The doctrinal statement of the evangelical free church is either 10 points or 12 points, depending on how you count. Actually, it's depending on when you read them, whether it's the old doctrinal statement or the new doctrinal statement. We say the same thing, but there's 10 of them. And I'm not going to say that you have to believe those 10 things in order to be a Christian. But in order to be a mature believer, you do have to have a basic foundational understanding of seven core doctrines of the church. If you read through church history and you read all the creeds and you read the doctrinal statements of the various associations, denominations throughout history, you're going to find these seven elements are in common. That, we, that everyone who calls themselves a mature believer has got some sense of doctrine with some variations, but very slight variations, these seven core doctrines of the church. These are, these are the seven doctrines. Some of you know them. First is the doctrine of God. See, part of what it means to be, be a, a, a believer, a Christian, is that we have a monotheistic viewpoint of the world. We believe in one God. We come out of a, Jew, uh, of a Jewish background, which is monotheistic. Oh, well, that's another one of those big words. It means we believe in one God. We believe him to be the creator and the sustainer of the universe. We believe him to be a loving God who intervenes in human history. So the doctrine of God, the second is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of Christ it deals with the, the second part of the Trinity, the third part, guess what, the third point's going to be what? The Holy Spirit. You, you can anticipate these things. So the, the doctrine of Christ, we believe that, that God sent his son to die upon a cross as a sufficient sacrifice for our sins and to rise again in victory over death, and that we await his coming. We, we believe in Jesus Christ, born of a virgin Mary, lived a perfect life, was crucified, and rose again. Anybody who claims to be a Christian is going to have to adhere to this basic doctrine of God and of, God, of Christ. They also have to have some sense of doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now, here we get into trouble because, you know, the, the, the reason we have so many denominations, so many different churches, is that we have differences of opinion. But whether you are on the, uh, on the, 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 the far raving charismatics part of the spectrum or whether you're on a spectrum that believes that the Holy Spirit's here today but he doesn't do those things anymore. We all have an understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that there is a trinity. And whether you explain it by use of uh, illustration of the egg or some other illustration, uh, we, we understand that the Scripture teaches a doctrine of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to be active in our lives today. We don't deny the Holy Spirit and remain orthodox in our Christianity. 
The, the fourth doctrine, which is, nece which is necessary as, as we mature in Jesus Christ, is an understanding of the doctrine of mankind, particularly the fall of mankind, that all men are sinners, that we all are in need of divine intervention in our lives. So when Paul says, I, I pray that I can come to you in order that I might provide what is lacking in your faith, he, he says this out of an understanding that he only had three weeks with them. And that means he didn't have a lot of time to teach them. And, and, and he began to be concerned that although they had the, the beginnings of faith, there was much room for them to wander. And so he, he wanted to come and, and solidify for them the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and the doctrine of man. And then following up with that, the doctrine of salvation. How is it that we are saved? There are some lines that we draw in the theological sand that say, this is what makes you orthodox Christian, and, and, and you, if you don't embrace certain doctrines, these seven core doctrines, you can't legitimately call yourself a Christian. You may say that you, you practice a Christian lifestyle. You may say that you, you uh, seek to embrace the teachings of Jesus, but that doesn't make you Christian, particularly when it comes to the doctrine of salvation. For there are some churches that say that, we're, that they are Christian who do not hold the necessity of Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. We call them theologically, we call them universalists. That everybody's going to heaven, nobody is going to hell. That God, Christ died for everyone, therefore there is no faith necessary to get to heaven. But that denies the teaching of Scripture. And so the issue of the doctrine of salvation, at some point we have to come to grips with the fact that those people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are going to heaven. We embrace the scripture that says, there is no name given among men by which we are saved except the name of Jesus Christ. And in, that in order to get to heaven, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. That means part of what it means to be a Christian is that we believe that there are some people who aren't Christian. Part of what it means to be saved means that we believe some people are not saved. That some people are going to hell. Those people who do not have faith in Jesus Christ. It is why in our congregation we have a yellow banner on the back with a bunch of names on them. We're, we're, it's why we pray our five-second prayer. Heavenly Father, please draw Shannon into Jesus Christ and make him an ambassador of Christ because we believe that without a knowledge of Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ, those people will suffer eternity in hell. That is one of the core doctrines, one of the basic doctrines of what it means to be a believer is that, we, that we, there's a demarcation that not everyone is going to heaven. So that's the, the, the fifth uh, core doctrine. The sixth one is the end, uh, doctrine of the end times. Now here too, churches separate because they have different understandings of the end times, but every church that believes in the, in the scripture has some doctrine of the end times. They know that this is not the final chapter that this is not the end of the story, that there is a time when God is going to come to earth and set things straight. So it doesn't matter whether your eschatology is amillennial, premillennial, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or pan-trib, it doesn't really make any difference. You understand that God is, has, has said he's coming again, and that out of that, our life changes. Because it, it is part of that doctrine of, of the end times that we recognize that we have hope for the future and we have hope for the present. And so if you read all these doctrines and creeds and, and you look at the scripture, there, there is general uh, agreement among, certainly among conservative churches in these six and uh, the seventh core doctrine. And, and if you do not adhere to these seven core doctrines, then you can call yourself a nice person you can call yourself a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian. See, I can call myself Chinese, but that doesn't make me Chinese. I can call myself a woman, but it doesn't make me a woman. You can call yourself a Christian, but if you don't believe in the seven core doctrines of the faith, you, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. It's more important what God actually ends up embracing on the judgment day. So we got six doctrines so far, doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of Holy Spirit, man, salvation, the end times. And the, the, the seventh one was one which I believe was developing as Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, and that is the doctrine of Scripture. Now, we remember when Paul went to Thessalonica with Silas, what they did is they gathered together in the synagogues, and there they proclaimed the Christian message through the Scriptures. And the Scriptures that they proclaimed it through were, no doubt, the Old Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures. 
It's something which is it's a good exercise for us to, to read through the Old Testament and see if we can show from the Old Testament the, 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 the doctrines which are necessary and, and the, the prophecies which need to be filled in Jesus Christ. If we read what, what I often call the gospel according to Isaiah. And we see how the gospel is played out in the writings of Isaiah. And we, and we recognize that Paul preached from Scripture. And as, the, as, as we understand Scripture, we come to this conclusion, a conclusion which is reached by the church 1,700 years ago, that there's a certain uh, s- uh, segment of Scripture, of writings, which we call Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit and profitable for teaching and correction and, and reproof. And, and as we understand that God has closed his canon and we have all that we need for life and godliness contained in these books. And so, Paul, I, I believe when he's looking at, at the church in Thessalonica and he's wondering, I've planted this church, what do they need? He says, I want to come to you in order that I might supply what is lacking in your faith. And certainly what he would have done is to give basic teaching in the doctrines which are at the core of what it means to be a believer. But that's not where he stops. He says, not only do I wish I could come to you in order to fulfill up what's lacking in your faith, but I want you to have love which abounds more and more. And so he prays for their faith and he prays for their love. Look at what it says. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. So Paul prays that they would have faith and that they would have love. Now, this is a central hallmark of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, is that we live out our love. Jesus said that the world would know that we are Christians by our love for one another and our love for the world around us. As we grow in our understanding of faith, as we grow in our theological understanding of the seven core doctrines, what will happen and what ought to happen is that we, it will result in a growing love for one another. And true Christian love is shown not only to those people who are nice to you, it's not shown only to the people who happen to attend our congregation, but towards all men. It is is a love which is expressed not merely to believers, but to even those people for whom Jesus Christ died. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us that much. And this was an expression of God's love. And as a result of understanding God's love, we make a choice to love one another. And we also make a choice to love the lost and even our enemies. With the exception of the word life, there is no other concept which is more important than the abstract concept of love as as shown in the Bible. For the Bible expresses to us the love of God as the basis for his dealing with mankind. That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament, although we we sometimes confuse it with being just a set of laws, what the Old Testament is, is an expression of God's love as he directs the history of mankind in order for Christ to come in the climax of his love, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, in the death and the resurrection of his son. And out of that, we understand that, that the love of God motivates and changes our life, and it becomes the summary of biblical revelation that God loved us, and therefore we love one another. So the Scripture speaks so powerfully in, in terms of God's love, that, that He loved the world, that He sent His only Son. And then it goes on and says, we love one another because God first loved us. This concept of love flows out of our uh, understanding of our faith. And it it grows out of an understanding that God, in his multifaceted picture of his love toward us, has given us this incredible challenge and opportunity to impact the world around us. The Old Testament words for love include the concept of mercy and kindness. They emphasize loyalty and compassion. They they emphasize an attitude towards one another which is expressed in deeds, which is exactly what Jesus said, that as we love one another, it changes our response. As we choose to love the people, even those who are our enemies, it changes our response, and and it speaks volumes of the love of God to the world. And so Stephen's prayer, as he was being stoned, stoned reflects the, one of the noblest expressions of divine grace played out in the life of a person who's fully embraced the love of God. It is the mandate of love which motivated the early church to respond to the needs of the society around them and actively per- participating in the lives of people around them and, and elevating women in a society where women were unimportant, pioneering efforts in social responsibility, opening up hospitals and, and orphanages because love recognizes a social obligation. 
And it is out of our faith that we recognize that because we know Jesus, we express that love to a world around us. And as believers, we are not only and not merely the recipients of God's love, but we are also the channels by which his love affects the world around us. So is it any wonder that Paul would pray that they would, they, that they would have increased faith and increased love, that their love would abound more and more? It is essential to our spiritual growth and our spiritual love, our, our spiritual life, that love would abound that we would be willing to do things like serve meals at Homeward Bound. Even though we may never see the, the people who we serve meals for attend this church, we would express the love of God to them because that's part of what it means to be Im impacted by Jesus Christ. So you've seen my outline so far, and if you're looking at the back of the bulletin, you know that the, you, you probably have a pre pretty good guess what the next one is, right? Because he's prays for faith, love, and what would be next? I couldn't hear you. And you're wrong. Faith, love, and holiness. Although we might like to say hope because Paul says these, these, are these, three, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. In this passage, what he says is, I pray that your faith may increase, your love may increase, and that you might have holiness. Look what the text says. This is verse 13. May he, that is God, strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy. That's the call of the, on the believer, that we would have a holy life. Now, I would suggest it is a holiness which is based upon our hope in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to, I believe, he's going to say throughout his writings that we need to have these core disciplines, these, the disciplines of the spiritual life, things that we ought to be involved in in order to, to respond appropriately in an inward level to what God has called us to. So disciplines of prayer, of service, of worship, of Bible intake, and the discipline of piety, the discipline of holiness. For holiness or piety is a choice and is a choice which is made on the basis of our anticipation that Jesus is coming again. You know, there are many times when because we know that there's a deadline coming, we, get, we kick into action. Yeah, I did this a lot when I was in, in college and seminary. You know, I, I had to get stuff done by a certain day, and, and guess what? I, I worked really hard to get that done. But if I, I had a task that didn't have a deadline, sometimes the task just never got done. When I was in, in college, I actually, I was out of high school. I might not have been in college yet. I actually worked one summer as a, a janitor in a school district I was in, and on there were three of us that worked in the in this particular school in the summer. And in the summertime, you know what they do? You know what janitors do at school? Um, they they strip the floors and rewax them, and they polish desks, and they do all kinds of maintenance stuff. Well, the guy who was the boss in that particular school was a guy named Roscoe Fisher. Roscoe was probably you know, you know mid fifties, like my age now. But when I was working with him, he seemed like he was like Pastor Coffee's age. He was like I thought he was ancient. And he may have been only, you know, in his mid-50s, but we were working for him, and he had, he had worked there forever, he, and he showed us how to do stuff, and, and he was going to go on a three-week vacation. And my coworker and I knew we were both young and energetic, and Roscoe didn't, he wasn't young and he wasn't energetic. And it took Roscoe about three times as long to do stuff as it took us. Now, it always got done really well when Roscoe did it, uh, but it took a while. So he was going to go on a three-week vacation, and he, when he left, before he left, he gave us a list of things to accomplish. Some of them were normal things, take the trash out, the, the things you have to do every day. But then we were supposed to strip and re-wax the hallways because nobody was going to be here, and, you know, it was an old school, you know, long hallways with these linoleum tiles. And, you know, you, you could take this stuff and you scrape it off. If you, 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 some of you had done that. Well, my coworker and I realized that we could do the whole thing. If we just stuck with, with it, we could do the whole thing in two days. And so we discovered that it was a school and it had a gymnasium. And we invited some friends over. We played basketball. We, on the clock, we did all kinds of stuff. It's not, you know, I'm ashamed of it. I should probably send back, you know, my, my salary to the school district. But um, then the third week that he was on vacation, we figured, well, we should probably get to work on this. 
hallway. So we started work on it on Monday, and when we came into work on Tuesday morning, there was Roscoe. He came home from vacation early. Who in their right mind does that? <laughs> you know, who would come home from vacation early and go to work early? And, and we had left this equipment out. We, 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 were, we were not good workers at that time. And he was just sitting in a chair next to a bucket with yesterday's stuff in it, and it was ripe, and the floor half stripped and and he just looked at us we came walking down the hall and we were just withering oh no and he looked at us and he said I don't care how long it takes and I'm not paying any overtime but you're not leaving this building until this is done it, it struck me at that moment that if I had known when the thief was going to come I would have prepared better for it <laughs> there's some biblical concept in that see if you know when the thief's going to arrive, you lock your doors. You take preparations. We have this hope in Jesus Christ. We have this hope that the trumpet's going to sound, that all of a sudden there's the, the big snatch is going to happen. There's this big vacuum sound in all the churches. And they're singing hallelujah. The, 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 you know, the, the hallelujah chorus is, go, is going through everybody's voice. You know, and and we're, we're up in the air and we're looking over and going, how did you make it up here? We're, you know, oh, we're looking up at Jesus and we're happy that he's returning. And, you know, we, here's the thing. We know that could happen at any moment. It could happen before I finish the sentence. Still did. It, I, it didn't in the first service either. But, you know, we have this anticipation that Jesus is coming again. He'd come at any moment. At any moment, we could be ushered into the presence of God, and because of that, there are certain things we don't do. For instance, if you are doing something you don't want your spouse to see, you don't do it just before they're coming home from work. Now, if you're doing stuff you don't want your spouse to see, stop it. Because God can see it, and if your spouse can't see it, you probably don't want God to see it. You get the picture, right? See, holiness flows out in part of our hope that Christ is going to return. That we recognize that we don't want to be caught with our hand in the cookie jar when Jesus walks into the kitchen. We do not want to be caught in the midst of sin when the trumpet sounds. Imagine that. You're, you know, we're floating up to heaven and, hey, what were you just doing? Uh, I'd rather not say. Paul says, I pray that you have holiness and blamelessness. It is the return of Christ which motivates us to live a holy life. It is an understanding that Jesus is coming again and we're going to all give an account of everything we've said and everything we've done. And so the return of Christ presents us with stability in life. It presents us with the challenge to live the way he wants us to live, to live a pious life. And that stability, when we have that stability of holiness in our life, there it produces in us sanctification or holiness. Because we know that Jesus is coming, therefore we live in a way which is pleasing to him, which is the way of holiness. And when we live in a, a way which is holy, it produces in us assurance of our salvation. I talked with someone in the last week or so, and I, I mentioned the, the doctrine of e eternal security, that once you're saved, you're always saved. And I happen to believe that that is what Scripture teaches. They challenged me afterwards with the, the idea of, what about those people who you know, were saved when they were a kid, you know, and, uh, and now they're living like the devil? And I said, first of all, uh, just because people abuse a doctrine doesn't make the doctrine not true. And on uh, those people who are not living a holy life have no right to fall, up, fall back upon the doctrine of eternal security. They have no assurance of salvation. They have no assurance that, yeah, I know I'm going to go to heaven. But it is through an understanding that Jesus could come at any moment. And by the way, he can, whether he comes in, in, and gets us in a mass group or he comes and gets you individually, he could come at any moment. Any one of us could be facing our Savior today. 
And the only way we have assurance of salvation is we recognize we have changed our life on the basis of our anticipation that Jesus Christ is coming again and we have chosen to live a holy life. Paul prays for blamelessness and holiness. He says there ought to be a difference in the life of believers. It ought to be recognized in our lives that we are responding to the anticipation that Jesus is coming again. So he prays for faith, love, and holiness, which is based upon our hope in Christ. So here's the thing. I've run out of time. And nobody's hitting their gong yet, but we're going to wrap it up with this. If Paul is praying for faith, love, and holiness in the church of Thessalonica, if those are at the heart of what, it, of what, what we need of, the, of spiritual life essentials, then we, as individuals who are seeking to be pleasing to God, ought to do a little mirror work. We ought to look at the Scripture and say, okay, if this is what Paul's praying for, would someone say his prayer was answered in my life. And so my challenge, I'm going to give you two challenges at the end here. The first challenge is this. Look into the mirror of Scripture and ask yourself if you could pass a basic theological test on the core doctrines of the church. Do you understand a baseline of doctrines? Not whether you understand a hypostatic union. Even the theologians don't understand the hypostatic union, but they say they do. You know, not whether you understand the intricacies of theology, but are you, do you have the basics down? And if you don't, do something about it. Talk to Pastor Andrew. Talk to me. Talk to one of our elders. Say, I'd like to be taught more about this doctrine so that I have a better understanding of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Second, well, along with that, ask yourself from the mirror of Scripture, am I treating my friends and my enemies according to the standard of love revealed in 1 Corinthians 13? For love is patient, love is kind, love, love is long-suffering, love does not keep a record of wrong suffered. Are you living a life of love? Does your love abound more and more? to the other believers, and also to everyone else. And then along with that, where are you in terms of holiness? Are you anticipating the return of Christ so that you change your life today in order to not be embarrassed on that great and coming day when the trumpet sounds? That's the first of, uh, application. Evaluate your own life on the basis of these three life essentials. But then another deeper application is to ask yourself, who is it in your life that you can be instrumental in helping be solidified in faith, love, and holiness? Who is it in your life that you can impart to them the knowledge, the basic knowledge of the doctrines of the church, that you can impart to them an understanding that the love of the believer is not reserved merely for the people that we like, the Bible doesn't say like one another. It says love one another, and you can love people that you don't like. You can rise to the biblical standard of love, you can, you, and, and you can challenge one another in that regard. And who, who is there in your life that you can challenge to live a life of holiness? So the first is reflective. How are you doing in these areas? And the second is, is projecting to others. How can you help others? to have what Paul prays for in this passage. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us today to be men and women and boys and girls of faith, love, and holiness. We ask this not that we would look good, but that we would reflect to you all honor, all glory, and all praise.